in the early days of the 1950s, you looked at the sky, and the sky was completely virgin. A place where we could see stars and the moon, but there was one object already there, the one star that had been made by humans. We were all of a sudden thrust into this new era of discovery. And what used to be in our minds and our imaginations, all of a sudden became real. Little by little, more spacecraft were launched, more astronauts, more cosmonauts. That's one giant leap for mankind. Pretty soon, the, the sky began to be populated. The truth is that as a society today, we're incredibly dependent upon space. The satellites in space that allow us to look at Earth and see where are those hurricanes coming from? Where are wildfires taking place? GPS constellation provides navigation. We can study coral reefs and learn about the health of the oceans. Financial transactions at the speed of light. Critical communications for defense and civil purposes. Our economy, our globalization is all driven by space technology. These eyes that we have in the sky that we hardly ever see. Space is also the newest human frontier and the single biggest thing preventing us from exploring further and for longer in space is the ability of our rocket engines to take us where we want to go in an efficient manner. I was strolling on the moon one day we went to the moon almost 50 years ago now, and we never returned. Oh, is this a neat way to travel? Why? Because it was not sustainable. Space needs to be open to the entire world. We can't just have a few selected human beings to represent humanity out there the seven billion of us, but only a few hundred have been able to witness the beauty of the planet. That doesn't seem right. We need to open it up so that anybody can go. Transportation is really the, the key to a healthy economy. In the expansion of the United States, the early travels were looking for a passage to the Pacific, but it was not until the transportation miracle, the railroad, that the dream of the Western expansion really was realized. And that brought along a whole economy of services. In the 1920s, air travel, was a rarity. Today we see millions of people in the sky at any given moment. And now we're at the verge of this new transition point into space. We are able to launch lots of objects into the vicinity of Earth, what we call low Earth orbit. But the goal is points beyond. That transportation has not been fully developed. Rocket propulsion today is remarkably inefficient. It works, but just barely. And that is our game. That's where we play. What we're trying to build at Ad Astra is a transformation engine that will redefine the way we travel in space to make space transportation easy, affordable, fast, and economically rewarding. Space becomes then a place of business. 
you know, a place of work. People don't necessarily just go to explore. Discovery now making one last reach for the stars. Most of the cost really lies in the amount of fuel that you have to carry. When you see a rocket, you're seeing mostly a fuel tank. It's a slow, expensive, cumbersome proposition to explore space with the technology we have today. And so we have to change that. Every ounce of fuel has to count for more. And that means the exhaust temperature has to be very high. The exhaust of a rocket is a few thousand degrees. We want it to be like the sun, a million degrees or two million. No chemical reaction can do that. So we don't do chemistry. We use electricity. We go from gas to plasma. Pulse. There's something exotic about working with plasma, working with something that is millions of degrees. The limit is that if you make it too hot, the rocket will melt. We choose not to be limited by metals or materials. Our pipe through which this exhaust goes is really a magnetic pipe, an invisible force. We have eliminated the most fundamental limitation in rocket propulsion, which is how hot you can make the exhaust. We inject a propellant, a neutral gas, into an ionization chamber. We launch radio waves at it. Those radio waves convert that gas into a cold plasma. This plasma then proceeds into the booster section, the ion cyclotron resonance. The next step would be to put electrical energy in to superheat the gas in a plasma state and accelerate it to the velocities needed for space travel. Ultimately, our rocket can go further and faster than any other rocket that exists today. And the rocket might be you know, similar size to what you would have for the, for the chemical rocket, but now the propellant that you need is only this much. The more cargo that you can carry for a given amount of ship, the more efficient your exploration program is going to be. Space transportation will be part of our daily lives, and it has to be safe and affordable, and that's the next horizon. Vasimir is one of those possibilities that will allow us to fundamentally transform space travel. The first time you see the Earth from space, it is almost a religious experience. It is the most beautiful thing that you ever saw. It, it is just as simple as that. First thing everybody does is unstrap and go to the window. Go to the window. And what you see is the most beautiful thing you ever saw. You don't come back the same. You don't see the world the same way. Space flight puts you in touch with the fragility of humans, the unimportance of humanity in the great context of space and the universe. Space is full of energy, full of resources, full of new places to go, and it's up to clever, inventive, uh, entrepreneurial human beings to figure out ways to use those attributes to, to make money. High power electric propulsion will open up the entire solar system to human exploration. We're basically enabling a whole market that's never existed before. Humans colonizing and, and utilizing the solar system for human benefit. Supporting space stations, sending supplies, sending fuel, sending water. You can see hundreds of thousands of jobs created by just a, a whole industry. We want to capture that gigantic wave of operations. We want to be there when that wave breaks. I think there are several similarities between 
Cummins and diesel engines and Ad Astra and the Vasmer engine. Cummins dieselized the truck engine industry after World War II and is now an $18 billion company. And I think that's the role of the Vasmer engine. It's going to transport goods, cargo and so forth throughout space in the most fuel efficient, cost effective way, which is a big business opportunity. The Vasmer engine can be the diesel engine of space. I spent 25 years flying in space. I was fortunate to fly in seven different missions. Virtually all the space shuttles, space station Mir, to walk in space, three spacewalks. I helped build the International Space Station. And I can tell you that there is an urgent need to invest in faster and more efficient transportation technology. And there is a whole gamut of applications. Just the body being in weightlessness for a long period of time tends to make your muscles very weak. Your heart is a muscle, so your heart can become very weak. When a human body is in space for long periods of time, the pressure on the back of the eye can cause some damage to your vision decreasing the travel time that you're exposed to cosmic background radiation, solar radiation, and the hazards associated with zero gravity. That's really the benefit to the astronauts. If you're doing scientific exploration, to be able to get research results in eight or 10 years instead of 35 or 40 years is a, is a huge accomplishment. Voyager was launched in the late 1970s and it recently left the defined solar system. It's taken a whole career, 36 years of people and their lives to achieve that. So you, you, you buy yourself a lot of things by going fast. And that's what we're bringing to the table. Good day from the International Space Station Flight Control Room, which is the scene of cautionary vigilance as flight controllers monitor the approach of a small chunk of space debris in the vicinity of the station that prompted the precautionary sheltering of the six crew members. When I flew my last space shuttle mission, the number one risk to the spacecraft and to the crew was getting hit by orbital debris. There have been rocket launches going on since the 50s, leaving all kinds of upper stages and space junk floating around the planet. And the problem has gotten worse because these satellites collide. The pieces of debris are traveling at very high speeds and they're coming in all different directions. It could really, in the wrong place, destroy the whole spacecraft. We want to pick up the big pieces before they collide. These pieces are tracked by ground controllers. And so what we need is a transportation capability which allows us to go and get these objects cheaply. That is not possible today. What our technology allows is that you launch one larger system that's more like a, a truck. And because we're so much more efficient at using our propellant, we can maneuver to as many as 19 different targets of space debris, rendezvous with those targets, and plant small chemical rockets on them so that they can be deorbited. Plasma rockets are able to do these kinds of multi-orbit transfers and bring these objects to places that are pre-positioned for disposal. One of the most immediate uses for our technology would be to keep the space station reboosted. Space station orbits in a way that it's constantly slowing down and has to be periodically reboosted to maintain its orbit. And that chemical fuel has to be transported from the Earth at a great cost. We're talking about $210 million. However, if you took a solar-powered Vasmir system and did the same type of operation, because we use so much less propellant and the power comes from the sun, we can do that same effect for about $20 million a year. And that is the promise of the technology, to make the ability to stay operating in space cheaper and much more sustainable than it is today.
there have been very damaging impacts. If one of these rocks were to hit the earth in a populated area, uh, we could have thousands of people killed. And that is the threat. Technologies such as the plasma engine can enable human protection of the planet. We have been working on the use of the Vasimir engine as a propulsive device that could deflect an incoming asteroid. We would fly to the asteroid and we would nudge it very gently over a couple of years until it moves sufficiently to miss the Earth. That type of planetary defense is very important. The main hindrance that we have, it's not a technical problem. It's the politics of space exploration. How much funding goes towards that? How much of a priority should we make being able to push technology that can sustain a human presence in space? The Earth is a finite sphere with limited resources. There will come a time when we use them up. What are we gonna do then? This is our only planet, and many people have said uh, we need to be a multi-planet species. We don't want to have um, the zero redundancy that we have today. Humanity can go in that direction someday, but we need to invest in our future. We can't just settle for what we have today and say, well, that's good enough. Vasimir is one of the most interesting space propulsion concepts that I have ever seen. Ad Astra and Franklin Chang Diaz and his team is making history. The Vasmer engine and the plans for its development are revolutionary. I feel like I'm at the first step of Star Trek, creating the warp drive that's gonna take people and future generations to great distances. Vasimir will be a game changer. Space is very, very large, so we have a lot of work ahead of us. But really is nothing but ensuring our survival. That's what we're doing it. As an astronaut, that's the way I see it. This is our home planet that we have to protect it. And if we don't do something, pretty soon this planet will be unfit for life. I hope that day never comes. Hopefully we will protect it and we will have developed means to let humanity expand into the sky, into the universe. I dream that that will happen and we're making that dream come true. Thank you.